All right, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to uh, this morning's panel. This will be a true panel. We're not going to give any talk, so I want it to be conversational. There will be time for audience questions um, after we run through our questions. Um, and so please, if you do have res questions for any of the uh, individual panelists, just hold them till the end and then I can run around with a mic. We are being recorded, so I don't want to have to, you know, interact with, you know, break things up to get a mic out to you during the, the uh, uh, presentations. So my name is Harrison Decker. I'm Associate Professor and Data Librarian at the University of Rhode Island, and I'm the Director of the Library AI Lab. I'm going to introduce our panelists and then just get started right away with asking them questions. So the 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 gist of this this morning's panel is that uh, I wanted to address, and this is sort of prompted by a comment someone made to me who works at a library that ha is fairly heavily invested in and offers great and extensive uh, programming training, uh, you know, in languages like R and Python and a variety of other, and GIS and a variety of other techniques. And they said, despite their reputation, um, uh, despite everything they're doing and all their success stories, they still get questions from the university provost uh, about, you know, why is the library actually doing this? So that got me thinking, well, maybe this CNI would be a good venue to have a conversation by for practitioners who are very heavily involved in, in just doing this sort of thing. So to my right, I'll start with our first panelist, and he's Matt Burton. Um, he's, Matt is a lecturer in the Department of Information, Culture, and Data Stewardship at the University of Pittsburgh School of Computing and Information. His research focuses on digital humanities, scholar, scholarly communication, and computing education. He teaches uh, design, data science, and web technologies at, in the Master of Library and Information Science program, and he has a PhD from the School of Information at University of Minnesota. Uh, sorry, just like, just like, let's make that University of Michigan. <laughs> Gotta make sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, <laughs> he does have a PhD, though. Okay. Um, <laughs> seated to his right, is uh, Vicki Steves. Vicki is the librarian for research data management and reproducibility. Uh, a dual appointment between the NYU Division of Libraries and the Center for Data Science. And her research centers on integrating reproducible practices into the research workflow, advocating openness in all facets of research and building, contributing to open uh, infrastructure. And she's the co-founder of the LIS Scholarship Archive, an open source, open access repository for LIS and allied fields. She also works on the ReproZip Repro -Zip project, an open source tool that enables full computational reproducibility of research, and Tagette, a free and open source qualitative analysis tool. Then we have uh, my colleague from URI, Indrani Mandel. She is a lecturer for the Department of Computer Science and Statistics at the University of Rhode Island, and she is the education coordinator for the URI Library AI Lab. Um, the Library AI Lab is only a year old, but has already been in the headlines for its undergraduate research and outreach programs. And Indrani's interests are machine learning, data science, and AI education for K-12 students. And then our final panelist is uh, Tim Dennis. Tim is the director of the Data Science Center, a research and education support unit at, of the UCLA Library. He's an instructor and instructor trainer with the, the Carpentries an instructor community that teaches foundational coding and data science skills to researchers worldwide. He recently worked to establish Library Carpentry as a lesson organization within Carpentries and serves on its uh, curriculum advisory committee. Tim's interests include research transparency and reproducibility, open data, and inclusive pedagogy. So to get started, I'm just going to go across the panel and we'll just, I guess, start, we'll start with at the far end and work our way this way. Um, I just want you to briefly uh, talk about your own educational background and the work you've done, been involved with and what sort of specific uh, programming topics you've taught or computation related topics you've taught. So start with Tim and work our way down. Okay. Um, so my, my educational, I guess, background, I have a master's of 
information management and systems from UC Berkeley, which is called the iSchool now, I think, and is part of the data science division, which is relatively new there as well. Um, and But I consider myself really a, a data librarian, and I'm self-taught as far as programming. I learned a lot. I worked with Harrison, our moderator at UC Berkeley, and learned a lot from him since he has a programming background. Um, and at Berkeley, I learned a lot because there was this uh, data science kind of renaissance that happened there as part of this Sloan Moore funding for data science environments. And it was really highly generative, and I've been taking what I've learned there and um, applying it to other places like UCSD and now UCLA. Um, the programming topics I've taught are Python, Git, um, Bash, um, I taught, I've taught like data visualization and those tools. We recently I've taught text data mining in R. Um, so we try to cover a wide gamut of things and I'm actively involved in developing the Carpentries program at UCLA. We're a member of the Carpentries. It's like a member organization like CNI itself and we're developing, you know, um, you know, more trying to scale up our number of instructors on campus and teach more of the workshops. I think that's kind of good. Ms. Um, so my journey started in India. I um, am an engineer by training and I'm an electronics engineer. Uh, when I moved to the United States, I joined um, University of Rhode Island and that's where I went to grad school. Um, uh, that's when I switched to computer science and got interested in machine learning and data science. Um, currently, I'm working there as a lecturer, and um, I, I teach computer science, core computer science courses. Um, additionally, I also uh, teach programming languages at the library. I teach R, Python, uh, machine learning. Um, and I also work with undergraduate students interested in research um, at the AI lab, uh, which is located in the library, which is a nice um, a thing because we get students from, from very diverse backgrounds. As for me, uh, I also came in to my higher education thinking that like English or the classics would be the best thing to do before library school. And shout out to Nanette Veyer, my old advisor, was like, oh, you should actually do computer science and just try it, see if you like it. And so I was actually sort of coerced into um, starting this journey that way, although very happily. Um, so that was where a lot of my background came in with learning some of the basics. And, and then when I started, I actually thought I was gonna be a corporate librarian. And that was totally disrupted again by NDSR, the National Digital Stewardship Residency, where I got like a really deep dive into working with different types of, of data and computational processes. And that got me really interested in the way that we are teaching new researchers how to conduct their work. So um, as a part of my role, uh, I teach all of the programming languages and concepts that my colleagues here teach. Um, I would say one of the things that I am also teaching are things like how to ask questions of data for machine learning or AI purposes. I have a lot of consultations with folks who are like, how do I make sure that when I'm fitting a da some data for a model that I'm not completely biased? Um, it's a hard thing to answer, but so uh, alongside of sort of the computational literacy stuff that I think is really important, we're also seeing a sort of a niche data literacy on the rise as a part of supporting data science as well. Um, uh, all right, so I have a very long kind of circuitous journey, so I'll try to keep it concise. Um, I have a undergraduate Bachelor of Arts in Bioinformatics, and uh, you know, so I had some kind of formal computing training, but also you know, uh, kind of situated in kind of uh, in a science context, so like scientific computing. Yeah. Um, and then I uh, you know, worked in industry for a while um, in information security and actually kind of wasn't really on a path towards libraries at all. And then I, one of my office mates was like, this information, you know, we were talking about the challenge of information security. 
Uh, and he's like, this is really actually a library science problem. And I kind of pivoted and, and um, ended up going to uh, the University of Michigan at the School of Information, which kind of uh, introduced me to the, to the information schools world, um, where I've, um, you know, I, I am today. Uh, I ended up getting a, a PhD in, in information um, and kind of doing a lot of work around, uh, you know, uh, a lot of my uh, dissertation work was in kind of science and technology studies and actually not computational at all. I didn't even tell people I knew how to code uh, initially because one of the things that happens is if you know how to code as a grad student, you very quickly get um, grabbed by a, a, a thesis advisor because they need, they desperately need people who can code because they don't know how or um, they want people to, to, to do that work. And I saw, um, saw, that, I saw that happen over and over again. And I, Seen that happen. One of the, one of the things I started doing at, at Michigan is um, trying to address this issue. So I, I started working with some faculty um, on developing kind of a, a computing education uh, workshop. Uh, you know, you know, kind of similar to the Carpentries, although uh, developed a little bit independently. Um, and then I did kind of get involved with some of the Carpentries movement. Um, and then since moving, you know, then I've uh, moved to the um, the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, initially, I was actually jointly appointed between the library uh, and the school. Of, at the time, it was the School of Information Science. Um, I kind of helped um, uh, launch a digital scholarship unit, and uh, we actually created a workshop series that was a joint workshop series between the School of Information Science, uh, or what was the School of Information Science, uh, and uh, the libraries on kind of running <coughs> workshops on technical topics like you know web scraping and data visualization. Formed the School of Computing and Information. I moved um, full time, so I'm a, a teaching faculty there, uh, and I teach a bunch of different um, uh, computing. You know, it, computing is you know I teach in a bunch of different programs. So I teach uh, in the undergraduate computer science program. I um, I, uh, I teach in the Masters of Information Science. Um, uh, you know, so I teach like kind of big ideas in computing and information, which is kind of a conceptual course for the undergrads, but also has a, a skills component to it, which is like um, you know, teaching undergraduates how to do Python and command line and Git. Um, and this is computer science undergraduates who actually never learn that. Um, they're just kind of expected to know it uh, by the faculty. So there's never, there ha you know, and they're like, well, why should we teach them the command line? They should already know how to do that, um, which is a very non-inclusive approach to um, uh, some of these kind of very basic uh, skills, which it ha I think is that attitude and that, um, you know, the, the need for the kind of the ba addressing the basic skills in, in a semi-formal setting, and you know, for, for the, all of the students is a, is a requirement, uh, or a, is a necessary step. So I've also developed uh, and work on this um, uh, research computing education initiative uh, that is uh, running an eight-part workshop series um, called Data Basics, uh, and that's actually for graduate students in the discipline who don't have an opportunity to, to learn, uh, you know, because the, the, um, the basics, you know, so we teach, um, uh, Python and Pandas, which is a data analysis tool. Uh, we teach Jupyter Notebooks and the command line and Git. Um, so kind of a lot of the similar, similar topics to, to stuff for Carpentry um, in this kind of eight-part series that's open uh, and it's free and open to anyone uh, in, the, in the university who wants to take it, uh, the you know, graduate students, faculty, and staff. Uh, and the goal here is to kind of give, um, it's mainly do graduate students, doctoral students, and master students in the disciplines and the sciences and the social sciences and, and some of the humanities too, um, to kind of learn those basic things that they wouldn't necessarily have an opportunity uh, to learn because uh, it's not taught in their formal coursework. Um, so I teach that. And then the other final piece on computing education that um, we're working on is we've, at Pitt, we've recently redesigned our, um, our Masters of Library and Information Science uh, and one of the um, uh, core components of this redesign that, you know, we're, that we're trying, you know, we're still working on it is on um, putting and embedding computing education um, for the library science students. Um, and, you know, we're still, that this is going to be a multi-year journey, but one of the things is I want to see the library science program as kind of a, um, a, an alternative path to learning computing um, for people who, um, for whom it, the, the path, the traditional path in computer science or information science um, and that door gets closed, or they feel that they're not um, included or able to participate in those communities, um, which is a recurring issue. Um, uh, so we're trying to kind of, in, in, and one of the key components for the library science program, and I haven't really figured out, you know, we haven't figured out how to do this, but uh, is um, 
the, uh, you know, there's a huge demand for computing education uh, and computing needs broadly um, in, uh, in higher education, in K through 12, and in, um, generally. And so um, part of what, I, what, I, what we're trying to do is not only teach the library science students um, computing topics, but also um, equip them and teach them how to teach. So kind of a train the trainers um, thing because um, you know the, the Pew had a, a study that um, people are looking to their um, librarians to help them with computing education topics, especially in public libraries. And so can, if we can kind of um, equip the, the students with these skills, then they can kind of go forth and, and help address these, these broader needs. So to kind of jump right into the uh, <clears throat> to ensure that we actually address the topic of the uh, panel. I would like to just toss out the question to the panel. Um, from your experience, what, what are the pros and or cons of teaching these types of topics in a library? Um, just quick thoughts on that. Um, and I don't know, I'll, does, does someone want to start? Vicki? Oh, you're looking right. Okay. Well, <laughs> we'll start challenge. with Vicki, but sure. um, um, and whoever, just jump in if you have something. Yeah, so teaching data science topics in the libraries, the pros and the cons. So the pros, I think, that Adrani was, was mentioning is that people feel like the library is a space where they can come and fail if they need to. So a lot, um, a lot of folks who are coming saying, I don't really know the basics of AI or machine learning topics or predictive learning, whatever, natural language processing, text mining. Um, I don't want to go to this workshop in the Center for Data Science because they're going to assume that I know every like all the toolkits walking mm -hmm. in and I really don't and so the library becomes a space where they can try and fail at these new topics which is a key part of the learning process so there I think there's sort of a safety net in knowing that like I'm here to provide you this service and I'm not judging your computational ability and in fact I'm here to scaffold you so that you can reach that one of the cons is like the opposite, where people are like, why does the library know or care about this, which is what prompted the panel. So like how would walking into the library and seeing me, like they don't equate that with data science expertise for lots of reasons. Um, being in a library, being a woman, um, uh, so that sort of cultural problem is, is yet to be addressed, I think across the board for computing education, but especially in data science where the demographics are so homogenous and badly skewed. Uh, I would like to add a few more uh, things. Um, when we run our data science or machine learning or natural language processing workshops, we have uh, professors, graduate students, and undergraduate students all taking the workshop at the same time. All of them um, have similar questions. Um, again, how what Vicky has mentioned. Um, it's, it's a safe place. Everyone is treated equally, and they feel uh, that I'm not an expert, I'm here to learn something, and it's okay to ask any kind of, kind of questions. We, um, uh, including myself, when I go to a workshop, um, I, I don't feel like I'm a f faculty. I feel like I'm going there uh, as a student to learn something. And it's a great opportunity because the libraries are really providing this neutral ground where uh, we can all go as students, as, as uh, someone who is interested in learning a topic. I can add to, I, I concur that, uh, I remember I saw a talk by uh, Fernando Perez, who's uh, kind of the guy who started Jupyter Notebooks, and he had a big slide um, why they chose the library at Berkeley to put the Data Science Center, Data Science Initiative in. And he says the library is like Switzerland. So it has like a neutrality, like uh, Adriani was saying, that is more welcoming. It also, I think for me, there's a virtuous cycle of, so data services have been part of libraries for a long time. Right? Now it's the neolism is data science, right? But it's been doing a lot of this service and consulting for a long time in libraries. And there's a virtuous cycle that happens when you consult with people over time, you see all these use cases across the disciplines. Oh, people are doing text data mining across many different departments. So those use cases kind of can formulate and become a, a curriculum, right? So you know what to teach. You know people are struggling getting beyond the, their laptop if they open a data set with eight million rows and it doesn't open. 
So what are the kind of heuristics with that? When do they need to move to kind of cluster computing? When do they need to do some refactoring of their code? So I think that's a rich ground bed for, for addressing common problems in academia, and then you can develop lessons and teach and include you know, a diverse set of people that you know, are cross-disciplinary. So I think that's a real strength of libraries. I think there's a credibility issue that might be the con. So like who, how do, you know, I don't have a CS degree, so why should anybody listen to me when I'm telling them you know, how to code or whatever? But I think it, through kind of a, a reflective practice when you work with people, they, you develop a good word of mouth and they'll come back to you. So. So I think libraries are a great place for, for teaching this stuff. Yeah. One of the things that, um, you know, so I'm mostly teaching, you know, I teach and I'm a, a faculty member, so my, like, incentive structure and my organizational life is kind of governed around, you know, the terms and teaching classes and, and, and um, the needs, however, don't necessarily conform to that, that structure. And so one of the things I'm trying to do is, and, is collaborate and work with the library uh, but also and and also work with our um, high performance computing center and try to like kind of create this triangulation of um, of people with you know, you know the HPC as a computing infrastructure at the School of Computing and Information we have some of the, the expertise uh, and the library has um, you know kind of physical infrastructure and also temporal um, a, a different temporal rhythm that I think can uh, because one of the things is after the classes end. Um, there's always that, okay, I need, you know, so I loved your workshop. How do I do Python package management? Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, and how do I use this, or how do I install this specific package for this, because I'm a, a biologist or I'm a, 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 you know, a molecular and biophysics uh, grad student, which I just had a whole bunch of them in my workshop. And I don't have, I don't have the ability to kind of do that, um, that support work. Um, just not enough hours in the day. And so, um, but that's where I think the library can help, because uh, I think the key component of this is to build a learning community within the university. And I think that's the universe, you know, the library can, is, that's what they're um, structurally set up to do. And so they can, you know, if we can kind of, the hard part though, the, the con, you know, that's the, the benefit and the, the, the power and the potential. The, the hard part though is just um, trying to figure out the organizational configuration like you know, how who who's going to pay for whose time? How are they? You know, how, and and library, to their credit, spends a ton of time um, thinking about the uh, the organizational sustainability of a service, um, to the chagrin of some of the grad students and faculty who are trying to you know work on this, and the, they just want to do it. And the librarians are like, well, let's slow down, let's think about it. And so there's you know a, a balance there, but I think when it you know when when it does come when everything can come together, I think it can be. Powerful. Uh, so to pick up on that idea of uh, learning communities, uh, one of the, I think one of the limitations of, of this mode of instruction that we were kind of talking about for the most part, the, being the workshop format, is inherently problematic with um, these technical topics that, so because you, you, you don't become a Python programmer in a two hour workshop. So I would like to ask like a, a very practical follow-up question, and that would be, what have you done to address some of the limitations of the workshop format? For example, dealing with prerequisites, um, scaffolding, um, finding times, just scheduling is very hard in, the, in a university setting because everybody has their regular course schedule. Uh, students might want to take something at night, but uh, Grad students and faculty might have, you know, outside lives that require them to go home. So, can you talk a little bit? Um, I have to, I want to go home. <laughs> Did I say that wrong? Yeah, anyway, um, so do you want to go home now? <laughs> um, so anyway, what have you done to address some of these limitations? Matt, um, I have taught the workshops in the in the evening. Actually, the grad students really want it in the evenings. Oh, okay. Uh, or some of them do, and then some of them um, can't. So I teach. Sometimes I do the workshop series in the in the during the day, and sometimes in the evenings. It kind of depends on if I have other evening classes. Um, in terms of like uh, scaffolding, um, I, you know, the the workshop is very much a basics 
And I, I up front, I tell people, like, you know, I mean, it, we've extended it, so it's like eight three-hour sessions, so that's a little bit of a longer engagement. Um, so that, uh, you know, I say, I kind of do set expectations up front. One is, you know, I don't have any expectation that you're, you have experience with this. Um, I have everything set up. Like, they, don't, they just need to show up with a laptop that has a web browser, and then everything is running in a Jupyter Hub in the cloud. All the materials are on Git and automatically get loaded. You know, so that's kind of a technical answer to some of this, uh, which is, you know, they don't have, there's not this, like, getting everything installed and set up um, stuff. So I kind of, you know, scaffold them in, in that way. Um, and, but I do set expectations on you're not going to leave this workshop like a, an expert Python programmer. Uh, one of the benefits I have is the students are super motivated because they're opting in to take this. This isn't a required class per se, although um, it's an open free workshop. So they are personally motivated, which I, you know, is not always the case in a teaching context. Um, but I do have that benefit so that um, they work on that. But again, I think uh, the, p the next step is how to, how to give them the ability to continue, and I haven't really figured that out. Um, I've had conversations, because one of the things is like, faculty will be like, we want all of our doctoral students to take your workshop, and it's like, okay, that's great. Um, they do it, and then but what changes are you making in your curriculum to then reinforce what they learn? Uh, and they're like, well, we don't, we can't do that. We, our curriculum is this can't change it so like it's like well then you know it's not gonna work like I can't do this there there has to be substantive change in the disciplinary um, curriculum and classes have to kind of you know okay they'll have basic Python but you need to teach them the methodologies because I'm not teaching them the methods uh, and you need to include influence infuse them with the computing that they you know you can kind of assume that they have and yeah, well, I wrote down Jupyter Hub and expectation management, so pulled that thread a little. Um, the thing I would add to that is in dealing with the workshop format, something that's really important to me is to build out open educational resources that they can always come back to after the fact. So all of my sort of data science focused classes are applications based. So I'm not in, I don't teach like, this is what a variable is in Python. I say like, this is what a variable is and you're gonna put your part of your data set into it. And so everything that I teach is, is has the pedagogical underpinning of like you're gonna, you could modify this code lightly with a different data set and be able to work with it. Um, and that relies really heavily on me creating a larger scale open educational resource to point them to after the fact, to walk them through some of the other projects. I would also say distributing the, the actual teaching, like I collaborate with some assistant faculty at the Center for Data Science who come in and teach some of these intro workshops as well, and we co-teach a lot of them, and I think that also um, signals to the students uh, something that, um, that there's a lot of support for in the university, so they could come to me, they could come to this faculty member. Um, and I think that's really powerful and empowering to them when they're in the middle of like an intro ML workshop and they don't understand probability and et cetera. Um, I have noticed running the same workshop um, twice uh, as often at different times of the week um, is beneficial to a lot of students because scheduling is a problem. When I have the time, the graduate student might not have the time, or the undergraduates might uh, not have the time at the. So uh, running it twice, once to, uh, maybe during the work hours, one maybe after five o'clock is a good idea, or running it on Fridays between two and five has worked well for uh, with our undergrads for me. Um, as far as prerequisites are concerned, um, I have it uploaded on, on GitHub so they have access to previous uh, lessons. I always like to teach them in, 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 in a uh, series of workshop. Uh, that means you don't walk out of the workshop after two hours feeling like you are an expert. So you have to keep coming back. Uh, that is an expectation I said in the beginning of the workshops and uh, I have had great success with uh, students uh, returning for the entire series. Yeah, so there's a number of different things you can do to help um, with like pre-wex or tech setup. 
Um, you can have install fests. I've done that before. Like in libraries, I like to get our systems people involved, you know, if they can become helpers at your workshop, get people set up and configured. Uh, I taught a, an African American studies class that's on the mass incarceration phenomena this last quarter. And because it's for undergrads, I didn't want to have all the setup stuff, and I taught it completely in our studio cloud, which is a you know, cloud-based R tool. Um, and that worked pretty well, because I could you know, distribute the notebooks to them, and they could work through it with me. Um, I always teach live coding style, and I have a bunch of exercises within the class. So people have points where they have to work through a challenge or you know, stretch themselves or apply what they've learned. I think that's very effective. The last thing I've done it's like, is partner with specific departments. You know? So we have a good relationship with a, a, the Masters of Social Science and the Masters of Urban Planning. And we, when we teach these workshops, we get, because you, know, you want to encourage kind of peer learning and peer teaching. So if you get people to come from the same department together and you reserve some seats for them, then you can kind of get that happening because they know each other and they feel more welcome. They build confidence. And then lastly, you know, you, on the feedback loop, you want to have them come um, seek you out for consulting or to get help because they're invariably going to want to do their research and then they, they've learned some basics in R or Python, but then what is the next step? You know, oh, I want to apply this. I'm, I'm having a problem with this package in R. And then they'll come get help from you. So you, so you want to see it as a whole cycle. Teach a workshop, you get consulting. Teach another workshop, you do it. You try to encourage like peerage, um, and that works kind of well. So. Can, I, can I add one thing super briefly? Is that I always show how to debug in my classes. Like I will often intentionally put errors into my code to be like, oh no, I have no idea what happened. Let's go to the internet and find a solution. And I think that approach also really helps students after the workshop to be like, oh, I saw someone like who is my instructor run into a problem and solve it and follow the same steps and they can probably figure a lot out after the fact too. Yeah, that's an excellent. I mean, basically, I, you, you, we are, like in the Carpentries do now encourage people, if you're a really good typer, which I'm not, or a speller, which I'm not, so I have error all the time, but if you are that, we encourage people to introduce error. Because you know, getting over error, the fear of having errors is the real big thing. And having kind of persistence and resiliency with that is something you really want to come out of a workshop. So definitely. So let's shift gears a little bit because I suspect um, some people in the audience may say, these sound like great things, but uh, you know, we, have, we don't have the staff to do that. Um, so let's talk about the staffing side for a little. So one is, I mean, we could probably spend a lot of time talking about, you know, what's missing from the MLS curriculum. Um, so I don't really want to go down that path. Although if anyone wants to bring up uh, any ideas or if you know of new curriculum that's being introduced. But since we have a couple people here that are doing things kind of on the uh, margins of libraries or between in the intersection of libraries and computer science, Maybe, and I'll address this, this to Indrani first, talk specifically about what li libraries and librarians could do to attract more computer and data scientists like you to come and work with us. Um, I think the initiative needs to come from above, like the administrators, um, provost dean, uh, to encourage this environment of, um, of learning and data science and uh, computer science. and. Um, uh, encourage libraries to to set up this kind of units or spaces, providing. Uh, I was uh, at another um, a talk yesterday, um, and they just created this the space which attracted lots of students, uh, which would not have happened if that space did not uh, exist. Um, so URI has been uh, proactive with it, and our uh, provost and um, library's dean, who is here, <laughs> has been very supportive. Um, uh, I am among the three faculty who, uh, who are um, associated with computer science and uh, libraries. Um, 
uh, what would attract us um, is providing us this environment and this opportunity to work with diverse set of students. Um, it really helps us. Um, we don't usually have access to this diverse set of students when we are tucked away in the computer science department or in the engineering department. Um, library really helps us to, to find the students and this diverse projects. Uh, we have had great success um, with students from nutrition, uh, biology, um, uh, social sciences, uh, to name a few. Um, yeah, so it just provides us with this with this incredible amount of wealth, um, where um, the students are our resources, and where we can be um, helpful and useful to the to the community. Matt, would you like to add anything to that? Um, so this was, the question was yeah. making the library friendly towards computer science. This is something that we are very, yeah, so actually when I first started at the University of Pittsburgh, I was in a jointly appointed position across the, um, the library and Human School of Information Science as kind of a, an explicit effort similar to, to kind of connect um, uh, the department, the academic <laughs> department with the, the, you know, the, the, the unit, uh, the library unit. Um, and there's a couple of us, uh, you know, and that's kind of, you know, worked on um, developing the digital scholarship services um, unit at the, at the library. Um, we don't currently have anyone uh, in that position, but it's, I, I think actually these kind of, you know, I'm really interested in these kind of uh, these joint appointments and kind of, you know, kind of creating that, uh, creating that space. I mean, this is something that we are trying to do. I mean, this is, that relationship is also working itself out in the School of Computing and Information because we're, um, you know, computer science, information science, and library science all together in Academic unit, and we're all very different, uh, and so we're all kind of sorting out, uh, you know, and, and building up those relationships. I mean, this is a new school that's just been recently formed uh, in the last couple of years. We are also hiring uh, <laughs> teaching stream faculty, tenure stream faculty. We are looking for graduate students. Uh, so if you know, if you're, yeah. You know, anyway, come see me. Uh, we are we because uh, uh, like uh, you know the. We're doing this. We're uh, I'm all this stuff. I'm kind of doing on my own, on a you know very lean. I get one course release to kind of work on all these workshops and stuff. Um, I get uh, somebody you know, and a lot of it is just personal connections. I have somebody from the high performance computing unit who is a friend of mine who like helped me spin up the, the Jupiter uh, instance, and then I you know have connections and people in the, in the library um, who are you know, and it's like a lot of it is like personal favors and just personal relationships. Uh, and you know, and I think now it's now we're at this place of like, how do we institutionalize this? Uh, and that's kind of where we're at right now. And you know, taking that, you know, I'm really good at like finding the people who are on the ground who are going to do the work. But now it's we got to socialize up to the administrators and kind of get them to to, to do buy-in. Uh, I forgot to mention another thing. Um, we also have Joan Beckham here with us, who is a. Would you please raise your hand? Uh, she, she is a professor in computer science department and also works with us at the library. Yeah, yeah it's, it's another approach you can, um, it at least has been effective for me is that, and I, you know, UCLA is a big, big library. So we have like, you know, a lot of programmers, one of which has a master's in machine learning and computer science who works in our, um, our software development team and so he's become a carpentry's instructor, so he teaches with us, and he also consults. And I have in my unit, have two programmers who um, are now kind of being refashioned into data science uh, specialist. And part of that is we provide you know, training and support for that. So look within, if you have a big organization, look within to kind of fill some of these roles. And if you have a digital library like we do that are doing kind of machine learning on their collections, that's a perfect way you can kind of externalize that as a service and, and get those folks to help consult uh, for your unit or build a unit, right? So this can be research facing and not just internally facing. So that's what, that's what we're trying to do. Okay, I wanna, I know we've been talking about the carpentries a lot and I wanna make sure we, uh, talk a little bit more about that in case people aren't familiar with it. 
I, I can't remember when I first learned about the Carpentries, but I think it's safe to say I was probably one of the early librarians to go through instructor training six or seven years ago. And at the time, I, this was at UC Davis. Um, and at the time, there was one other librarian involved, and she was unique in that. She was a former re research scientist with a PhD, uh, Amy Hodge from Stanford. And uh, I thought, you know, this is great. This is like, this would be ideal for librarians, but the cynical part of me thought, ain't, ain't gonna happen. Um, you know, librarians are busy. They're skeptical about some of this stuff. But then they proved me wrong, and now it's really taken off. Um, so many, li I, I think I was just at a meeting where uh, they were telling me they had like 20 certified carpentries instructors or something at their library. So it's, it's really kind of exploded. So Tim has been really involved with uh, the carpentry. So maybe just a few words about the carpentries movement and their, their pedagogy and um, you know, a, a few thoughts on, on the importance that plays, for, especially for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, and maybe what what sorts of things librarians have been doing in that program? Oh, yes. Um, so as you mentioned, there, I think mean, librarians been involved in the carpentries for a good good while, but um, and various roles. But so the carpentries is a global. It's a volunteer network of instructors, and we teach like uh, basic and computing. Um, and data skills to typically researchers, but now information professionals, librarians, research staff, um, on how to do their research better, how to automate you know, tasks, how to be more reproducible in their work. So all these are kind of wrapped up into the carpentries. And there's three carpentries, a software carpentry, which teaches best practice in software develop development techniques, because a lot of researchers get into you know, doing their research and they have no background in CS, they don't know how to write scripts, and so it's, you know, teaching some of those best practices. Data carpentry is geared at um, more domain-based, so there's data carpentry for genomics and social science and geospatial, and it's more, it's geared to the methodologies for those specific domains and dealing with too much data that researchers don't know how to handle it. Right, how to manage it, how to analyze, how to do data visualization. And the library carpentry, which I've been involved with um, on the governance, governance committee, and now we're the latest carpentries, so there's three carpentries. Um, and then that's more geared at teaching librarians how to code and deal with data, how to kind of automate their own uh, work processes, and then be better, be, be able to better engage and communicate with technical staff in their libraries and also be able to engage better with cutting edge research, right? So those are kind of the, the three carpentries. And if you want to become an instructor, you go through a training program that is really not about technology, it's about how people learn and how to teach. And we use kind of education psychology best practices on, you know, on those kind of facets. And you go through a two day workshop and then you become certified as an instructor. Um, I think that's, and then libraries, yeah, so the librarian role, the library carpentry has been like three or four years old, um, and we're, you know, I think there's a lot of also members of, because Carpentries is a membership organization, a lot of libraries that are members of, are members of the carpentry, so it's kind of taken off, and like within the UC system, I think we have like probably 20 librarians who are, who are certified, and we chat teach workshops together, so it's kind of an active environment. And yeah, one of the cool things about uh, the library's collaboration with the CDS, the Center for Data Science at NYU, is that we actually split our Carpentries membership. Oh, so cool. it's supported by both organizations, which um, has been great for me, because I don't have to do all the administrative work, I can share that too. Um, but also just this deep understanding that like it's a great place for learning to happen in both of these multidisciplinary spaces which has been very cool to see. So, I'm sorry, I should have you know, forgot something. But one of the big components of the Carpentries is we really want to have, and it, you know, it's called inclusive pedagogy, really have a warm, welcoming environment where people can come in regardless of their background and build confidence and have a positive mind, mindset so they can learn and grow, right? So you know, we have a really serious, we're serious about our code of conduct, and we do have a real, like, it's been pretty successful in um, and 
in this mission. So now we have, we're translating lessons into multiple languages. We have an African task force that has been really incredibly active and wonderful, like the work that they've done in the continent of Africa. We have have workshops on all seven continents. So we really have a global reach and it's, it's really premised on being inclusive and to try to improve um, the, the representativeness of, of, of people in computing and, and data science as well. So, yeah, so anyway. So before I open it up for audience questions, I wanted to just go through the panel once and give you an opportunity to mention, uh, maybe just pick one sort of new and upcoming program, service, uh, training offering that's code related that you are, that you have in the works for the near future. If, so if that's relevant for you, just just to give you a chance to promote something, you know, what it is you're, what it is you're up to. Uh, Matt, you wanna start? I mean, you, well, I, your thing, job's a little different, but. Yeah, I don't have any, uh, well, I mean, you know, and um, trying to, you know, the, I guess a new thing. One, one of the, actually, I, I'd say it's not a specific, it's an infrastructural thing that I'm, uh -huh. I'm working on. Is um, uh, you know, so it's not an educational offering, but it's uh, one of the things I'm trying to do is um, deploy, uh, you know, get a, a university-wide Jupiter Hub deployment. Uh, you know, and I you know love Jupiter, and uh, you know, it's the one of the things that brings people. Uh, you know, they're like, oh, I, I hear about this Jupiter thing, and I, I need to 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 learn it, uh, and then they learn it, and it's Changed my life. Um, I've had a couple people come say that, and I was like, "Oh wow, oh, that's th that's a nice feeling." Um, and uh, you know, so I, trying, to, you know, I've been working on kind of getting an, a, a, a large scale deployment so that we can do teaching. You know, because as a platform for teaching, it's just it's really fantastic. Um, the computer scientists don't understand it or like it, um, but everybody else, the, the scientists and the, the com you know the social scientists. This, it's just a no-brainer, um, and so you know that's and that you know they're the ones who are like really um, uh, using it. So um, you know, trying you know building up and and so part, I, I would say one of the things that I've been um, the thing that I've been um, looking at and, and kind of using as inspiration is all of the work coming out of um, the UC Berkeley, um, both on kind of the infrastructural Jupiter Hub deployment stuff that they've done, but also they are um, developing curriculum materials, uh, you know, in and, and also talking about how to teach with Jupyter Notebooks, and so like all of that stuff. So everything that's coming out of Berkeley, out of the Berkeley Institute for Data Science on this stuff, I think is, is really great. So it's not something I'm doing, but it's so, it's something I draw yeah. on. So that's, that's yeah. That's the data eight course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm also I want to address like one major challenge of supporting data science, sure. if I may. Yeah which is something I want to have a conversation about. The hardest part for me in supporting data science is collecting, like actually providing data. A lot of the data sets that students email me uh, are like a Google site with a million images of a face and the person who runs it needs a signature from a department head, but we might want to collect it and give people access to it in the library and it's one researcher maintaining that and they're not equipped to deal with like libraries collection stuff or even like be willing to have a librarian broker that agreement. So for me the thing that I really want to work on moving forward is almost less on the pedagogy side and more on sort of the maintenance and infrastructure for collection to support data science. So that's like my major challenge that I'm hoping to address. So we at the URI AI Lab are interested in uh, K through 12 programs, um, especially in machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, we have just hosted our first uh, AI summer camp for um, kids uh, ranging in age from seven to 17. Um, uh, it was a huge success and one of the, one of the summer camps was absolutely free and uh, we, we identified there was a need um, for AI education among uh, this, this group of students who uh, belong to the underserved communities. Um, we definitely identified um, a need there. 
and uh, we are working on a couple of projects. Uh, one of them is an after-school program um, where the students would come to the URI library and have this uh, two-hour session um, instructed by uh, one of us uh, on artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, uh, apart from that, we also reach out to, uh, to, uh, to uh, schools. Uh, we do talks and just raise awareness about artificial intelligence and try to break some of the myths about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Yeah, I, um, I was trying to think. Uh, the, one of the, to this class that I mentioned on mass incarceration, they're gonna be doing a second a quarter, which will, they'll have their project, so we're gonna do some more teaching, and I really enjoy teaching R and mapping, which is, I'm gonna formulate that into regular workshop, because I like getting away from proprietary tools like Esri's, um, you know, grip on um, geospatial. And the other thing I'm talking with some colleagues is, uh, about like data ethics and you know eth ethical concerns around uh, machine learning and these kind of black black box systems of of algorithms and you know we're gonna we're talking about having like a workshop uh, series around that. Okay, so uh, are there questions from the audience? Um, I need to bring the mic out because we're being recorded. So, great. Thank you again, that was an awesome presentation. Um, quick question on how you entice students. I know you said they sort of come to you, but do you, and you were talking about outreaches, um, are there ways that you reach the students in non, um, say the non-computer science, non-engineering students, um, some you know, like hackathons, those kinds of things, and how do you physically do it? Do you actually go to the colleges, go to the classes, sit in the you know, a breezeway and, and wait for people to come to you. Um. I mean, I laugh, but I do hold office hours and I get a lot of people that way. So standing in the breezeway is not a bad choice. Um, I actually mainly see non-engineering and non-computer science students in my like intro machine learning and intro to get in things classes. A lot of times um, it's the students outside of those disciplines who feel like they're behind and want to catch up even though it's not the case in reality. Um, I'm sure the computer science students would benefit quite a bit from coming. Um, so I actually think that when I'm looking at sort of my metrics of who's attending, it's mostly master students by far, and mostly in non-engineering and computer science disciplines, or people doing computational research but not in comp sci or like computer engineering. Uh, I have a few things to add to that. Um, we do actively um, contact professors across campus um, and um, try to advocate um, data science and machine learning to be integrated into their course curriculum or at least talk to their students about this, this workshop that are available um, uh, so that they can attend these workshops. And um, uh, we advertise them heavily um, uh, through our uh, university newsletter um, on any every digital media that's that's present across the campus. Uh, as far as our outreach programs are concerned, we work with um, Office of Diversity, um, and uh, we do uh, by by now we have uh, several contacts with schools directly, um, and they they have approached us. Um, uh, to to uh, coordinate with them, and then we also attend events um, all across Rhode Island. I I um, just the dean of graduate students. I'll just the deans will I, you know whenever I run offer the workshop, it's a you know there's a, just a form to sign up. So I'll just email the various deans and say, hey, distribute this to the grad students, and then it it just fills up. Uh, and actually, last term, I sent it to a waiting list, and it filled up, and I, like after a day, and I actually have no idea how they found it. Um, I think that there's, you know, the demand for the computing, like the Python computing stuff, is so great that like I just put it out there, and it it, it fills up. Which you know, I, I I actually don't know some of the under, like I think it's just like 
you know, every, every year or every term it'll be a different, like it'll be engineering heavy or business heavy, and I think it just it gets circulated amongst the graduate students. Um, but, you know, the, the place I, the, the way that I've started is by emailing, um, like, the dean of grad students uh, or, like, a, you know, the dean of research at a different school, and they'll distribute it. Usually I ask them, can you distribute this to the grad students? And, and that's, how, that's how I've been reaching um, uh, the, the graduate students, at least, who've been the primary um, students, people have taken. So let's take one more question, because I think we're just about out of... Oh. Uh, thank you for an excellent, excellent panel. Um, uh, Jane Greenberg, I'm an iSchool professor too, and we have, you know, we've, we've incorporated data science. We have data science certificate now, and I um, lead a program called Leeds Library Education and Data Science. We've now graduated 21 fellows in the area, so we're really into this space. But um, it's a little self-promotion. But sorry, I, we have share, spread the joy, right? Um, but my question to you and anybody in this room is. Um, dealing, not everyone here is a librarian, but we are seeing these services needed in libraries. And how do you get this into things like the ALA accreditation? Um, these conversations need to happen. We just got through our accreditation, and it's a process. And we, all, you know, for people who have an accredited ALA degree, it's still very important. I know some schools ha don't do it anymore. Um, there's a long debate there, um, but. How do we, this is really important for future librarians. And so I would be interested in any comments people have on this. Thank you so much. So we're doing that, we're going through accreditation right now. Um, and uh, so we'll see how ALA responds to some of the changes that we've made to our curriculum. Um, but I think this, the, you know, for ALA, the standards you know, there's the set of standards, and um, you can you you, know, you you can describe how you meet those standards and what evidence you you marshal to to do that. So I think part of it is, you know, there's interpretation that happens in what those standards mean, and I think you know we'll see how they respond to the changes that we've made. Um, but I think it, you know you just have to. I mean, I think I personally think there is some flexibility in that accreditation process. Um, I don't think it's in ALA's best interest to not accredit a previously accredited institution. I mean, like, so I think maybe there needs to be a little bit more, this is being recorded, but a little bit more risk taking on the part of the faculty who are you know, doing that accreditation process. But it is, I mean, the, the problem with that is the process is so incredibly, uh, it's not, you know, it, it's very involved. Uh, to there's some aspects of it to that to the credit, um, but there's some of it that it seems like it's just a lot of paperwork, um, and so like maybe you know I mean I, this has been a reoccurring conversation in the high schools about how to streamline that process and, and and make it more flexible. But there's a lot of programs that are accredited by ALA that um, have that are you know have this data science. I mean Michigan is a good example. They are the whole program is accredited by ALA. Uh, and you know you can go through that program and take only data science classes. So you know I think there is the space there, but it is a it's a hard process. I that's a little yeah. scary that there's only they can go through to get a library degree with only data science classes. That that is it's ALA accredited. Reference. Now, they, I mean, it's ALA well, accredited. Um, they don't typically go to libraries. Interesting. Um, they go to what. But the whole program, that's a structural configuration. God, the next panel is going to be about that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so I want to pull right, that so thread I, I for like five more hours. Take, let's take one more, let's take Pitt, one more question. You have to take, <laughs> at Pitt, though, you have to take the uh, core, core library oh, course. Well, it so is, much it of is my 10, is so people like want to run to break, but we have. Reference. Good morning. My name is Teresa Bird. I'm dean of the yeah. University Library at the University of San Diego. I am on the board, the accreditation board. Uh, for ALA for library schools. So I certainly enjoy hearing your comments this morning. I'm not sure you can, we only accredit the MLS programs. There is so, no MLS program at Michigan, well, it's MSI. Then there has to be a track or something, because yeah, I'm agreeing with her, program. we wouldn't uh, uh, credit a program that is not uh, But you don't accredit not. tracks, you yeah. accredit programs. So, um, but your comment from the library school faculty member, I think, 
whatever you would like. Um, I can, you can share your information with me. You can give it to Karen O'Brien. We are looking at the process, I have to tell you. I read all of those documents, and it's a lot of stuff to read. Yeah. So I am certainly in favor of streamlining the process, and we are looking at that right now. So thank you. I just wanted to share that you had an accreditation person listening to your comments. <laughs> thank you. All right, everyone, thanks for uh, coming, and Thank we're, you. we're around, and uh, feel free to chat with us if you'd like. <laughs>